Hi, my name is David Chandler. I'm one of the 2019-2020 public fellows for the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities. And this is my last video for Fridays with the Fellows. And so in my previous videos, I talked about uh, board gaming. I kind of gave you an overview of why I think board games are interesting. I talked about building a collection and what goes into that. And for this last entry, I wanted to talk about how to introduce somebody to a board game. Hopefully if you've watched my last couple of videos, you might have seen some board games that are interesting and you want to introduce them to somebody else. Uh, and so in this video, I wanted to kind of give you some helpful tips on how to do that. In the process, I've conscripted uh, my wife, Caroline, to help me with some of the video examples. She is also a firm believer in the role of the humanities. Uh, and she uh, has sat through several of my terribly long tutorials for board games. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and get started with some tips for how to introduce board games and how to teach them effectively. So the first thing that you want to consider when it comes to teaching somebody a board game or introducing somebody to board gaming uh, is making sure that you do it with the right board game. Now, there are several things to consider in that capacity, whether it's player count, you'll need to know how many people you'll be teaching, you'll need to know how many people will want to play, but I also find it useful to think about theme. In the last few videos, I talked about theme a bit abstractly, uh, but I find that when you're introducing board games to a group of people, go with a theme that is readily understandable. If you can look at the box and tell what the game's about, you'll have an easier time teaching it to somebody who's completely new to the hobby. Luckily, Caroline and I have a collection of games that kind of run the gamut of a lot of different themes. Our favorite themes are... Monsters. Even bigger monsters. Potion making. Boats. Ghosts. Pirates and boats. Bikes and racing. Racing with pirates and boats. You do like an awful lot of boats. We live in a landlocked state. So as you see from our collection, we have games with a lot of different themes. But why I think themes are important for introducing games to people is because if you tell somebody I'm going to, we're gonna learn a game about giant monsters fighting or bicycle races, they can immediately picture it in their minds. And that makes the game a bit friendlier, a bit easier to come to. I'll talk about what that looks like in practice a little later, but after you choose the right game for your group, uh, your next step is to prepare your introduction. You don't want to go in and sit down with a group of people and read the instructions to them because it's kind of a terrible time. Okay, so when it's your turn, take up to the number of actions indicated on your badge, and you may choose to take fewer actions um, or take the same action multiple times. And so the actions are move. You can move your hero. You can move your hero along the So as you can see, going in without any sort of preparation can lead to a really boring time uh, for those few minutes introducing the game. The ideal board game tutorial should take maybe 10 to 20 minutes, depending on the length of the game. So there, whichever game you buy, there's probably plenty of videos teaching you how to play on YouTube. Certainly read the instruction manual through a few times. Set up a dummy game uh, before you even introduce it to people. Set it up on your table. Play a few rounds with you pretending to be more than one person. It'll introduce you to the mechanics far better than any sort of tutorial video or introduction. 
And it may be tempting to send your friends the instruction manual or some YouTube tutorial videos before you play. And if the group really isn't that familiar with board games, then you're just kind of giving them homework. Uh, the group that I play with regularly, I'll send out tutorials for them if there's a new game, but that's because we all know how games work. And even then, only one other person in the group looks at them. Um, you're very much appreciated, Karen. But don't send the people homework. Uh, prepare the introduction yourself. Uh, that'll go over far better. So let's talk about what that plan would look like in practice. And here's where choosing the right game comes in handy. Uh, you want to lead with the theme. If you lead with just the ideas of mechanics and they're all kind of abstract and you're telling people how to win without putting it into any context, it becomes a bit harder to understand. Uh, for example, let's look at a bad way to introduce somebody to a game. Okay, so today we're gonna learn King of Tokyo. And before we touch all the things, um, you need to know how to win. And you win by getting 20 points or being the last person in the game. So, yeah, we can get started. Well, how do you get points? Oh, you get them by uh, rolling the dice. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, sure it does. There are numbers on them, and there's, you know... But what's the story behind this? I am a teacher! Oh, you always do this! So, again, abstract concepts without anything linking it to a story doesn't really work. So, let's see what it looks like if you were to put some story behind it, to give it that extra bit of context before you jump into how the game plays. So, uh, today we're going to be playing King of Tokyo. And everybody at the table is a huge monster, and we're all trying to take control of Tokyo City here. So we're going to win by creating a bunch of destruction, punching each other. It's How do we great. punch each other? Uh, good question. You take all of these dice, and then you roll them, and then you see what it tells you you can do. <gasps> cool! Punching! No, 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 no! So hopefully you can see the difference between those two types of tutorials. One is very closed off and stilted. And the other is more welcoming. Uh, you're essentially asking somebody to sit down and play with you. So let them play with the pieces. Uh, maybe have them help set up the game. Certainly encourage questions. Even if you're not at the point in your game tutorial where you want to answer those questions, at least acknowledge that they're thinking about how the game's going to be played. And again, with the theme, and you connect it to a story or you connect their actions in the game to some larger meaning, it'll be far easier to teach a game that way versus completely abstracting the theme and just telling them how to roll dice or play cards to win. That little bit of story can make all the difference. So the next recommendation I have is to consider a technique that I call scaffolding. It's when you bring a smaller game to a board game night, or you introduce the players to a smaller, simpler game that is in some way connected to the larger one. Either you'll be doing the same thing on a larger scale, or maybe it has a similar theme. Uh, it's a way of kind of introducing the person to a style of gameplay that they might not know, or they might not be familiar with on a much smaller scale. And you can use that as a stepping stone to much bigger games. Okay, so I've got a great idea for tonight's game night. Let's play Descent. All right, we're talking three hours of dungeon crawling. We're going to be fighting monsters and dragons. Even brought the expansion. It's going to be a great What's evening. What's a dungeon crawl? It's when you go down into a dungeon and you get loot, you know... Maybe let's work up to that one, and let's play Welcome to the Dungeon. Okay, it'll kind of give you an idea of what a dungeon crawl is before we jump into all of this. Sound good? Okay. Soon. What was that? What was that? What was what? 
So scaffolding is a bit useful because it gets people playing a game a lot quicker and then you can have them help you set up the next one. It's also a great way to introduce small concepts that will later ramify into playing a bigger part in the next game. So, for instance, if you were to teach a game like Mysterium, which is a game that involves a lot of silent communication and everybody's working together to solve a mystery, one person's a ghost and they're giving out clues, maybe start with a small game like The Mind. It's a game where everybody is quiet and they have to put down numbers in a certain order and you can only communicate via body language. It's really difficult and it's a really fascinating little game. Uh, but you can see the principles of the mind and nonverbal communication on a much larger scale in something like Mysterium. Or if you're going to play a game about deduction, uh, something like Whitehall Mystery, which takes about one to two hours and one person's a criminal and everybody else at the table is looking for them. Maybe start out with a couple of rounds of Love Letter. It's the social deduction game that's shown up in every video. Um, also, you should just go ahead and get Love Letter. Again, it's ten bucks and I've gotten my money's worth uh, out of this thing far more than just about any other game in my collection. Um, but this way you kind of start off with a, an easier game and then you kind of build toward the larger one. It's a much friendlier way to jump into some of the more complicated games. So my last recommendation may seem like a bit of a downer and is to go into your game night knowing that there's a possibility that the game might not go over well. Sometimes if nobody at the table is engaged, or if it's a bit too complicated, or it's running too long, sometimes you just need to call it a night. So it is your turn. Is, is that right? I think... I don't know. Let me see. Does that count as a movement or an action? You know, why don't we call it? I'm just not feeling it. Maybe tonight's not the right night for finish. Yeah, but I mean, we're already two hours in. We might as well finish, maybe. I'm exhausted. Let's watch Netflix. Fine. But Netflix is for winners. Put on Jimmy Fallon. You'll know when a game just isn't really connecting with the people at your table. And that's fine. It's happened to me on more than one occasion. It'll probably happen to you if you start introducing more and more board games into your, into your social group. And that's fine. Um, so if that does happen, then just let everybody engage in a different activity. Um, or better yet, if you've planned it out and you had some games to scaffold and maybe one of those was a hit, can spend the rest of the evening playing a few rounds of Love Letter or The Mind or any of the other several games that I've shown off here. Uh, teaching a board game can be intimidating. It's you talking for 10 to 20 minutes in front of a group of your friends. And if you go in unprepared, it can be a bit of a disaster. It's like the world's worst performance piece. But if you go in with a bit of a plan, uh, with a bit of practice, you'll be absolutely fine. Uh, and hopefully you'll end the night with a few good memories and a game that maybe will spark interest among your friends and your group. So you'll play it again or maybe branch out and you'll build an obscenely large collection like I've shown off. So good luck and happy teaching. And that's it. Those are my tips for how to introduce board games to a group unfamiliar to board games or what they have to offer. So hopefully this video and the previous two I did, hopefully they convinced you that board games are worth considering or worth at least stepping your toe into the hobby. It is vast and it is broad and it's a lot of fun. So if you're stuck at home and you want to introduce a new board game to your family, or a close group of friends and you're nervous about it, uh, hopefully these tips will help guide you on your way. 
Um, lastly, I want to say thank you to the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit too much about board games or things that interest me. Um, thank you for all the work that you're doing in putting, making the humanities more available to people during these very trying times. So keep your eye on the website. Uh, pay attention to some of the events that they're hosting because they're all going to be great. And take care of yourselves. Uh, hopefully you'll have a few good games in your future. Thanks.